We are finally here with the much anticipated, on our part, video on the three ways that we use GoPros in the field for wildlife production. We've been working on this project for how long? A uh, year and a few months now. A long time. A long time. It was his idea. It's a great idea because we use them all the time. These things are so small and the footprint is just perfect for concealing a camera and getting cool stuff. It's just the perfect video to do just to give you an insight as to what can happen. Yeah, we want to share all the tips, whether it's battery life, cables, accessories, how we did it in the field. We want to make sure that you guys are ready to go out in the field and you have more success than we did because we had a lot of testing and a lot of failures. Tons of failures. I think the one thing that you'll walk away from this video mostly with is there is no set way to do this. Because in wildlife, nothing is the same. So how you're gonna mount it, where are you gonna put it, what animal are you trying to get? I mean, there's a million variables. Let's get into the first one. And that first one is underwater video with a GoPro. You can use a GoPro underwater. We all know this. You go on a vacation, you go to Costa Rica, you go to your bathtub, you put it under the water, right? That's what they're built for. The new ones, you don't even need a case for it. But have you ever tried to photograph or film fish? We have. And maybe you can tell us about some of the accessories that you use to get it down there because we were filming salmon. Well, and Brandon's right. It's, it's the most obvious thing to go underwater with, right? You can just throw it on like a little floaty handle. And if you're on vacation or you're trying to do something with turtles or whales or whatever, you just go like this and you just follow the animal and you're good. The way we're using it in Alaska is salmon, any mammals that are underwater. So we've tried to get, and we don't have any footage yet, but we've tried to get bears walking by it. That can totally happen. It's just a time thing and we're always pressed for time. And then there was a situation we had last year where we were filming American Dipper. And actually Brandon started that whole deal too because we were up filming eagles and we stopped by a little favorite hidey hole that we have. And we were, I think we were going to shoot some stand-up stuff, right? Well, you were showing, we were going to do the conclusion of the eagle video that we never posted for you guys. And we were going to do that and we saw that little dipper, remember? And we were sitting here talking on camera, doing what we do, talking to each other more than the camera. And this little dipper caught our attention and it was just flitting, but it was really close in proximity and it, it was going underwater. It was catching little fish, like it was fantastic. And so we actually pulled out the cameras and started filming it. I spent at least a week. I went down there every day for a week or more, maybe six or seven days. We were sitting here talking just like this and this dipper's over here. And if any of you are familiar with dippers, a lot of times they're working a river stretch that is, you know, could be half a mile long. I'm not even sure what their total range is. But the place we're at is limited. It's, it's tight and, tidal influenced. So that means they only have a certain section of the river to work. So they, and it's a pretty popular spot. So they're really accustomed and habituated to people. So it was really cool opportunity. I mean, Dippers are, didn't you say he's more of a birder than I am? I know we need Eric here. Yeah, we definitely need <laughs> Eric here. But didn't you say that they're the only like songbird that it goes underwater? Yeah, they're one of the few songbirds that will go underwater. They do a lot, you know, they'll sit on a rock and they'll do their little hopping thing. And then they're boom, down in the water. And I'm like, man, how cool would it be to get footage? But it took me five days with GoPros. And the other thing is, is this water is super cold, right? Right. <laughs> so these batteries don't last very long. They make a, a clamp on cover that has got additional batteries that go inside the, or inside the clamp, but go around the GoPro, you take the door off and then it's still waterproof. So then I was able to run a GoPro for like two or three hours underwater, which that's what I needed because you can never predict the exact spot no. where these dippers are going. No. Well, and the problem with putting a GoPro underwater is as soon as that is submerged, you lose all your connectivity through Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. And so you, you can't monitor time. And you don't want to be reaching in there and pulling it out and checking it and then putting it back. And so it's one of those, you just set it and leave it. After a while, you figure out, okay, the recording was 20 minutes long or an hour long. And you realize, okay, it's 
that's all we got. And so you can monitor that time. But yeah, the little GoPro batteries, when it's running in cold water, it's, it's not a long time. Here's what we do just to make this work. With the dippers, the dippers are a good example because we used right on water level, we used underwater, and then it wasn't terribly deep. So we had a lot of There's more variability. When we do salmon, the place where I've got the best footage, the water was up to here. And that's at low tide. Yeah, so I'm high, I can't, I'm either gonna go totally submerged to set it down there or I'm gonna drop it and hope that it lands flat enough. And then I'm gonna use my foot to try to figure out if it's level. When I wanted to get the water level footage, I would just take a little tripod like this. Obviously it's gonna depend on the depth of the water where you're working. Sometimes I'll put rocks underneath to get it a little bit higher or I'll take rocks away just to get a little bit lower. And then it just sets right at water level. And that's kind of cool because mm -hmm. we were able to get close up to dippers that would land on a rock. Yep. If we want to go underwater, this is the easiest, cheapest way to go. This is, I don't even know what they call these clamps. It's like an alligator clip. So I'll find a flat, heavy rock. And it's usually maybe the size of a dinner plate. Yeah, like a flagstone type Yeah, thing. but it's got to be that wide. And then you just go in there like that. So then the rock's on it. Then you got your camera on it. Now you've got the weight to keep this thing underwater and you can get it placed where you want to go. Mm -hmm. But it is really tough to get your level and it's kind of noticeable. So you think, ah, oh, I'd probably get away with it. But if you're seeing the top of the water, you it's really got to Yeah, it's a very awkward horizon. And you know who figured that out? If any of you are familiar with the My Self Reliance channel, John James, he and I were out filming one year in Alaska and he had this clip. This is what he does when he's around the doing his channel is he'll clip it on a backpack or he'll clip it on his belt and so he had it with us and we we're like oh a rock and it worked when you're in deeper water this works but what we figured out on a boat trip when we were doing the bears a couple of years ago i went to the boat captain and i was like do you have anything heavy that i could screw one of these gopro mounts to you know something that i could get the camera mounted to something heavy and make it almost kind of permanent well he had a dive weight on the boat and on that boat he's got every kind of tool possible so he was able to help us and he was totally into the project so he's helping us drill into this lead and but we drilled into it and then we screwed one of the traditional gopro mounts we screwed that little mount onto the dive weight and then you put the camera right onto the dive weight and you get to put it right down in the water. Now, a trick with that is getting it levels difficult. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot of guesswork. Yeah, because you just let it go, it's deep water. If you're in waders, you don't want your waders to fill up. Yep. So what I found is I would tie a string to the mount, but you can't just let the string float because one time I, it floated right around and I got really cool footage, but I got this string floating in front of the lens. <laughs> what I figured out was tie the string and then get yourself a stick and tie the other end to a stick and then go get enough string that you can go to the bank then you can plant that you and go. then you can retrieve the GoPro that way too. If you're going to try to do bears walking by, you don't want to have too much string because they'll snag it or whatever. And then away right. goes your GoPro. You're still going to find it. They're not going to take off with it, but no. it's just going to make it more difficult. Right. So that's a little cheat code. The third thing that we use underwater is this guy. I just found it online, but this is basically like an underwater housing, but it's made for a GoPro. So you just put your GoPro in there, lock it down, your GoPro is waterproof, but this just gives you that ability to do half in, half out. And if you all are familiar with underwater photography at all, this lens is not nearly big enough to give you that really cool half in, half out. But this gives you the separation you need, and then you can get half in and half out. The problem, the biggest problem we have with that is when there's salmon in the water, there's water splashing all over. So the tops of your to the tops of the bubble here, it's constantly wet. So for underwater, that's the best way, but it just adds that element that you're not gonna get any other way. The second way we've used GoPros is for walk-bys. And this is something that you can deploy. You have to have a decent idea that the animal is going to move from one direction to the other, have enough time to get in front of them, place a GoPro in a position, and get that nice walk by. Now, Michael's done this successfully with moose in Alaska, Mostly with right? moose. Because they typically go in a leisurely direction, right? And you can pick it out. The toughest thing is predicting the movement. So if you 
I spend so much time with the moose that a lot of times I know a trail that they're going to be on. Or I see this situation where there's a cow over here and the bull is obviously going to go up there at some point. You don't want to alter the animal's behavior. So you want to keep a pretty low, out of the way footprint, but have it close enough where it's actually cool. Yep. So a lot of times what I'll do is, you, this little system right here, little bitty tripod. I have a little bit bigger tripod too, because it depends if there's tall grass, it depends on the size of the animal. Let's say if you want to try to get a beaver <laughs> hauling, you know, branches in and out, it would be amazing, right? Especially timed with underwater footage. Yep. It would be super cool. <clears throat> but the level to which you want to put the height is going to depend on what you're, what you're mounting it to. I have a little small rig tripod that has some adjustability. So that might be even a little bit better. But again, it's the biggest thing is not altering the behavior and then getting it in a spot that's not obtrusive. You don't want an animal to go way around. You just want it to go right by. The thing you're going to struggle with with a walk by is going to be light because it can be in the middle of the day. If you have to have some patience and a cloud comes over, your light's going to be changing. We try to run neutral density uh, filters on these things. They just twist on. Of course, this is the one that I struggle with all the time, but they just struggle on. Yeah, they struggle on. <laughs> I struggle all the time, but the, the NDs just twist on and off. There's a ton of manufacturers out there. We've had decent luck with, I have the newers. K and F. K and F. So we've had decent luck with that. We did have, there was one and it did turn it a little blue. And so we modified that in post. But yeah, neutral densities are an easy way to make sure you're getting that more cinematic look with those walk bys. Talk about your tripod because it's, even better than this one because of what it is. Yeah, so for the walk by, sometimes animals don't do what we want them to, right? And so you have to be patient. One of the things that has really helped is battery life, right? When these things are running, because most time we'll hit record, set it down, check it, and walk away. Because we don't want to be, like Michael talked about, we don't want to be changing that animal's behavior. What this is, is it's a battery that plugs into the back of the GoPro. You can either use the door that's provided. They send a little door and it has a, a window down here and it plugs in there and then you can turn it on. Or this GoPro is using a media mod. It has a USB-C connection on the back. It just plugs into that. So you're getting the benefit of a battery within the GoPro and then the benefit of the battery being outside of that. This is charged separately from it. So you can place that down. You can also click record from this. You can change your modes if you're wanting to do the vlogging or anything like that, which we do do. It does turn, so if you want to modify the direction that it's looking, I am ashamed to say that it took me a while to figure that out. When I got this mount, it was set up like this, and I was wondering, how the heck do I set this up? Because you don't want to just twist something and just like, it's brand new, and just break it off. And they have this little secondary one to get even lower that comes out, and it's a secondary mount. So I thought for the longest time that every time I wanted to set it up on a tripod, I had to take this off and mount it here. Hmm. And I'm admitting this on YouTube right National now. National TV. <laughs> right? So you do not have to do that. All that needs to happen is you just twist. This is a total game changer. Uh, we use that same battery mount if you want to do long time-lapse exposures. The GoPros do a fantastic job of time-lapse. Just set them up, let them run. Again, that's something where you just set it on the ground get it set up, put it in time-lapse mode and let it go. This one has a media mod on it and this one does too. The cool thing about the media mod is you get really decent audio. Even if it's windy, you're gonna get usable audio. And there's nothing cooler than if you get natural sounds of, like the moose, for example, make all kinds of sounds. And if you can get that, and get it close. You know, we're out there with shotgun mics all the time and these actually do a better job right. when you're in close to get it. So if you're gonna try the walk-by stuff, I would recommend, what are these, like 80 bucks or something? It's not that expensive and you do get the benefit of a lot better audio. And it's actually set up where you could actually put an external mic on it and run like a little, what a road yeah. mic yeah. externally on it, which is kind of cool and would help, but I would highly recommend that as just the add on. The other thing that we add on to the top, this is Michael's idea, is one of these little bubble levels. Again, trying to get it level, it's just an easy way. It's one of those cold shoe mounts. It just goes in the top. That little level just then tells us, okay, you're good to go. My only annoyance with these media mods is 
if you're going to make us go through the whole time of taking our GoPro, taking the door off, sliding this in there, which doesn't seem like a lot. You slide it in there, then you close it, okay? Then you have this door that's just left. But then you have to go through and use your big fat fingers to then get in here and pull these up. And when you're cold or you're wearing gloves, it, you don't want to be able to get fish through there. So a little trick I found is use this and leverage it up. It works sometimes. What I would love to see, and you have a mount right here. This is a, a secondary mount, and this is from Small Rig, but it's a cage. They do make it so it has a quarter 20, but I would love to see a quarter 20 mount on the media mod also. Maybe instead of this. I see why GoPro does it. They have so many mount and accessory attachments that you got to kind of pick one. But that's my only annoyance with this thing, was changing batteries when we're filming in field or by walkbys, for walkbys, was a little bit of an annoyance in that regard. So just be patient with it. This little tripod is kind of cool because a lot of times, let's say we're shooting a big animal. It's a moose or a deer or an elk or whatever. And maybe you don't want to set it right on the trail or the trail is on the side of a mountain or whatever. And it's just hard to get everything set up just right. Maybe you have a branch. This little tripod is kind of cool because you can fold in the arm. You can put this, hold out your arm. So you can put that like right there. And I can use this to go around a littler branch and strap it to the branch and then get it set up. So. And maybe you want eye level, right. and that's the best way to do it. So you don't have to have a bigger tripod. A lot of times you can just use this little guy and make that work. And we will put links to all this kind of stuff. I think just about everything we got here on the table you could get from an Amazon or a Precision Camera or any of those places. We've used, it's not really a walk-by, it's more of a fly-in, but we've used the GoPros just by themselves too. So there was a time when we were up in Homer, we were filming eagles. And so at high tide, it had washed this dead sea otter in. Well, there were eagles picking on the sea otter. We took the GoPros and we set the GoPros on the rock and we built this little cover over it. Rock cover. Because the eagles aren't gonna spot this. They can spot fish from like a mile in the air, but they're not gonna spot my little like hidden rock GoPro, right? It didn't actually matter. They were a little cautious in the beginning and you'll actually see the eagle kind of like eyeballing it, but we still got that footage. It was really close footage and it was Awesome. Let's say you don't use the media mod. Provides for good audio. If you don't have this, this is made to just in, go right on the GoPro, right around the GoPro, and you do actually get pretty decent audio with that thing. If you watch any mountain bike videos or motorcycles or whatever, they'll wear the chesty mount, and a lot of times they'll just use that instead of the media mod. You'll run into all these problems no matter how much we talk about them but you'll figure it out and you'll have heard it. So you'll know that there's a workaround. You're just gonna have to spend a little time to figure it. So the most interesting one that we use by far was GoPros as a camera trap. And I actually learned about this from Michael, who was on a shoot in the Arctic. He can't tell you who yet, can you? Mm -mm. I try so many times. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they actually were using GoPros as camera traps, but maybe you can talk a little more about it. Yeah, they told me we were gonna use GoPros just as a small little footprint to try to capture fox dens or uh, caribou up there and a lot of nesting birds. So I'm like, okay, well, I've never heard of this before, but I'll give it a shot. And um, one person on the production had actually used it. So I was confident that it would work, but how does it work? Turns out GoPro makes the software, which is really cool because then you got a lot more confidence in putting some other software on your device. Cause that's what I'm always scared about. You get some third party software and it messes up your GoPro or yeah. renders it unuseful or it bricks it or whatever. So essentially you just go to QR control. No, you go to the GoPro website, right? Yeah, so there's an app. Download the app on your iPhone. That's the first thing. And then to get it on your uh, GoPro, you need to load it through a computer. So we'll put a link below. I don't know how evergreen that's going to be, so 
do your double checking. But yeah, you go out there and you take your GoPro and you just plug it in and you update it like you would a old software update. One of the things that we learned is that we had a max that it worked on. We never used the max in the field, but we used an 11, we had a 10, a nine, nine. and an eight. Let's talk about the different ways that we had to deploy these because there were several ways. We tried magic arms, we tried tripods, we put them up with ratchet straps, we tried paracord. And by the end of it, we got some really quick and easy ways. And one of them was with that tripod. Yep. And we would just strap it to a tree and we just throw a ratchet strap around it because we could buy a camouflage ratchet strap. And we just tighten it up and we'd be done with it. Now, some of the ways it didn't work were the magic arms didn't work too well. He has one that works really well. And it was one of these wider clamps that could actually grab onto a branch. The problem that I had is the magic arms that I had typically wouldn't go big enough for a decent sized branch that wouldn't wobble. But that gets you into the second problem of branches wobble when there's wind. Yeah, and when you're dealing with the camera trap, right? So you it's detecting motion. So there's all kinds of problems. The one problem is batteries. That's the main problem. The second problem is, is you get all these false triggers, right? When I found out about the software, I came back and I told Brandon, I was like, let's do a little project and let's try to get a mountain lion, which is a hard thing. And that is probably the best thing to use this tool is for predators and then environments where you don't want to be close, but it'd be cool to have that shot. Brandon and I set up a whole trial thing for mountain lions. We're in Denver. I have a buddy that has some private land out on the west side of town in the foothills. So it's close enough for us to get to, but far enough where mountain lions are, could be there. And it was our test. And boy, was it a test. Um, that project failed miserably. We did get a mountain lion or two, but it was all at night. The GoPros don't work at night you're not going to get anything. It has to be that early morning, late evening. Well, even something sometimes in the middle of the day, depending. But one of the things that was the most defeating is we had a camera trap that was looking at the same area that we had a GoPro camera trap set up. And that was just our control being that the camera trap. But what he means by a camera trap is a trail camera. A trail camera, sorry, would tell us whether or not there was an animal there. And then we could confirm whether or not the GoPro was working. And so we didn't want to just throw it out in the field and be like, yeah, there's no animals out here. So, and the trail cameras we used were uh, wireless or 3G or whatever. Yeah, and they would send you a notification, which was almost worse because it got to the point where he'd send me a picture or I'd send him a picture and be like, did we get it? And sometimes we just wouldn't get it on the GoPro. It's because we tried, first of all, we just tried the GoPro with the GoPro battery, and then no fly zone. Then we tried using V-mount batteries, and that does work if you're only gonna go like a day, a day and a half, that's a decent solution. So what you can do is get a V-mount battery that has a D-tap, and the D-tap, you plug in with the cable, go right from the cable or the D-tap mount on the battery to the power, the USB-C power right into the the camera. When you do that, you're exposing the camera to the elements too, just for that connection. So you got to be aware of that. Anytime we mounted it to a tree or something, it was fine because the tree would provide enough cover that it didn't ruin well, it. Well, and you had a good idea to put in a bag. In the Arctic, we were doing foxes and they are super curious. So my thought was, and we were working in sand. Funny enough, the Arctic is full of sand. I was like totally shocked. But what I thought was that I put everything in a Ziploc, the battery and the cable, and zip tied it so it was nice and tight because sand could potentially get in there, but I was able to minimize that. Then I would take a little trowel out there with me, dig a little hole in the sand, and then bury the battery. I went and uh, bought some big spikes, some steel spikes that, I don't know, 12, 18 inches. And then I went to a welding shop and I had them weld on a quarter 20 bolts to the top of that spike. And I had them weld on another little elbow that gave me a 3 8 Because if you look at the bottom of some tripods, you'll know when you get a certain ball head, it's gonna have a 3 8 inch here. So I wanted to have multiple options. The cool thing about the spike was, and it was sand, I could just drive it all the way down. That way I had a minimal little thing showing that the foxes would be interested in. So we got several more things to talk about. But what I said earlier was the batteries. Since this was a project that we could drive to every day and we were gonna work on it for a couple, two or three months, we figured the only way we we're gonna get enough power to let these cameras go for a week. Cause you gotta figure these guys are on all the time, but I think it's just analyzing a scene. And if something in that scene changes, that triggers the camera to come on. So, and you can set the sensitivity and you can also mask stuff out. Eric did this with this camera, the same software 
over a river. Well, you can imagine the river is constantly moving. So he, what he was able to do is go in and mask the river out, and you can do all that in the software or on the camera. So it kind of eliminates that. So if there was movement there, it wasn't going to trigger the camera, but he had a log going across the river. So if something walked across the log, it was still going to trigger. And it ended up working for him. Did he it? just hasn't got anything cool yet. He's got like a squirrel or something, okay. but it worked. If we're trying to go, if we don't want to drive up every day and a half because we're using V-mounts, we decided to make some car batteries. Batteries. What that entailed was using his genius of figuring electrical stuff out. So we essentially bought a... A marine grade marine. cover that would just cover it from splash, right? So that's protecting the battery, and then we can put all our wires and stuff inside this box. We have the little USB socket, and we started with standard USB 3 plugins. And over time, we had some of those fail, or maybe they didn't work in the beginning. <laughs> but we ended up switching them to USB C, and that provided a more steady stream. The USB C's didn't have the little internal voltage viewing area. Because a lot of, for whatever reason, the USB 3s had two plugs, and then in between it, it would tell you the volts, which was super nice. It was a downside because that voltage meter is always on, and so that could be a distraction potentially for an animal. But the USB Cs didn't have that, so then we had to start carrying multimeters. And so then it was a multimeter, and we had batteries, and then we had, he had this brilliant idea to carry the batteries in on, on an actual game bag that has a hard metal frame on it, and it's used for packing out meat. We threw the batteries onto that pack and we could get them in and out. So that worked really well. With the batteries, the problem is, is you've got to cycle them through, right? So it would last, we figured five days, About we'd five give days. it five days. Well, you got to take them, you got to bring them back to charge them up. So when you bring them back, you got to replace it with another. I think by the time we got done with this whole project, we had six of these six batteries, batteries built yeah. up. So we kept buying batteries. I would just go to Walmart like a thousand dollars in batteries. Oh yeah, we spent a lot of money and you're gonna spend a lot of money if you're gonna get it to work. And it's no easy task to be carrying a battery into the woods. But again, you wanna use that marine cover because you're protecting the environment as well. We would just share the load every time. One day I'd carry it, the next day he'd carry it. And it was a, a in external frame backpack that had a little shelf on it. The battery would sit on there, we'd strap it on. And then while it is heavy, it's not like, trying to, we did a couple of times, we were holding it over our shoulder or dragging it like this. It's a much better way to go, but that gave you the five days. So you're gonna wanna do that, unless you have something that you know is gonna happen within a day. If it's just gonna happen, like when I was doing the foxes up in the Arctic, they were pretty active. So I was able to get away with V-mounts, which yeah. lasted like a day and a half. Yeah, and then there was a den right there, yeah. exactly. So One thing on the batteries, please be careful with the batteries. Understand what you're doing understand the ramifications, make sure it's fused. We fused the ground, we fused the positive. We did not want any issues. The last thing you want to do is burn down the forest, right? So just be really careful with the batteries, okay? Yeah, we were on private ground and we didn't want to bother this guy's property at all because he gave us access. So you got to be respectful of the whole thing. The second thing you got to figure out is the software. So the software is on your phone and your phone is controlling the parameters of the software. Now the software is kind of cool because it has more than just the camera trap. Let's say you do a lot of racing, like Brandon films a lot of drifting. If he doesn't want that camera to come on until a car hits 30 miles an hour, you can tell it to do that. There are other things about the software. They call it QR control. And the reason they do that is because all your settings are stored in a QR. So it's a, that little squiggly square thing that you gives you some sort of pattern that represents the settings. So all you do is you set up that QR control, QR code, and you just, the camera's on, and you just show the camera that, co that code, and it puts all the and settings right in your camera. Yeah. But it was a lot of trial and error with us. You had exposure, you had shutter speed, you had all that like stuff run that times. you had. Run time, yeah. you know, there's a, th there's a setting in there that you can say, run for 15 seconds. If you don't detect any more movement, shut it off. But if you detect movement, then you can hit a little toggle switch that if it continues to see motion, then it continues to record. Well, and we actually had it, some issues where we were using the same QR code for several cameras and they were nines, they were tens, they were 11s. 
GoPro 9s, 10s, and 11s. And at some point in time, the QR just got mixed up or something. Maybe it was after an update. We aren't really sure what happened, but the QR code would actually implement this countdown and it would just be the GoPro would run for one hour and then it would shut down and then you'd have to turn it back on. And that was less than optimal considering it was gonna be out there for five days. To get around it, we just had to rebuild everything. And so sometimes things are introduced and you have no idea what happened. We still don't know what happened on that. Be very task oriented with a list and just make sure you check everything off when you're out there because you don't wanna have to come back or miss something, right? Now we failed miserably on the mountain lion project, but what we did is, we, what did happen is we learned a ton. Let's fast forward to this past summer and I was up doing moose and I we were talking about the rut pits and I thought, well, it'd be super cool to have a couple of GoPros, get a couple of angles, you're getting a big wide view, you're getting a big animal, let's just see what we can do. What I did is I pulled up the same QR settings that we did with the mountain lions, didn't adjust it a bit, and I started off as that's my starting point. And you know what, it worked every time. And you can set up multiple QR codes. So you can set it up for different lighting. So if you're gonna do early morning or late evening or middle of the day, as long as you set the parameters for the camera right, for that time of day, you're gonna be set, but you can have multiple settings in there. You can swipe through different QR codes depending on the settings that you want. So I had that as my base and it ended up working flawlessly. When you do this kind of stuff, you're always, it equates to me like you're panning for gold. Totally. Because anytime you set up a camera trap, you're like, oh, I can't wait to watch. I actually was looking at it, I'm just scrolling through, and boom, all of a sudden there's a bear on my camera trap, the GoPro Jeez. camera trap, chasing it on a mission. And we got the audio, so it's kind of cool. You could see a branch moving. So my guess is that that bear was chasing a moose. The moose came through so fast that it triggered the camera, but by the time the camera was on, was the moose was gone. But right behind it is this bear, and this bear comes just through the side angle, and he actually comes back in front of the camera. So we did successfully get a predator. We got tons of really cool moose footage. You know, the footage that you're gonna see in this, cool. this little video is pretty good representation of all these different types of ways to use a GoPro and just some of the cool shots you're gonna get. Now, what you're gonna get more of is shaking trees, <laughs> Snow falling on the ground, uh, birds, squirrels, wind. wind, skunks. Which is all useful. You gotta watch every clip and just be thorough. Try and just do a quick one. The one bonus thing to all of this is these GoPros are super fast and super valuable. If you watch any of the videos we've done, any of the videos that I did with Moose, everything where I'm talking on camera is a GoPro. It doesn't look amazing. It doesn't look bad though, it works. I'm gonna be more apt to record myself like this, really quick, hit record and start talking. Then I am to take my pack off, grab a DSLR, find a little tripod, set it up, make sure all my settings are right and get it. I'm just not gonna do it. If I can just have something happen and I wanna talk to what's happening, this is super easy. And if you guys see in some of the videos, I wear a binocular harness most of the time when I'm out in the field and I just stick this behind the binocular harness and I walk and it stays all day there. So if I need it, I can just grab it and just, and I got the GoPro set up so that when you hit record, it just automatically turns on and starts recording. The little battery tripod, that's another thing you can carry with you. It charges your GoPro. You can put it off to the side. It's USB-C, so it'll charge your phone if you need it. The last accessory is this. This is a cool little magnet. So it comes like this, it comes with the ball head. You're done. And you can go, I've been going 60 miles an hour down the road with it on the front of the van and it works fine. If you just wanna make a really interesting, dynamic piece, I think GoPros have to be part of yours. Well, thanks for tuning in. You've been with Truth and Legend. We'll see you next time. Bam! <laughs> is that Spider-Man?